Um, and it's my pleasure to get our afternoon panel on uh, is liberal democracy the future going with Melvin Rogers and Yasha Munk, who um, I'm going to introduce. So Melvin Rogers, who's directly to my left, is an associate professor in political science at Brown University. He's published widely on questions of African-American political and ethical philosophy, and his first book, The Undiscovered Dewey, explores themes of human responsiveness. His second book, which is forthcoming, looks the dark and light of faith looks at race, democracy, and freedom in African-American political thought. He has also written wildly for Dissent, The Atlantic, and the Boston Review. Yasha Munk is a lecturer in, on government at Harvard University. His first book, which was met with acclaim, Stranger in My Own Country, A Jewish Family in Modern Germany, came out in 2014. Since the election of Donald Trump past November, he's become a public voice of dissent and written and published wildly and has a forthcoming book on why our freedom is in danger, the people versus democracy, which he told me I could mention is available for pre-order on Amazon and will be out this January. Sounds like a good holiday present. <laughs> he's also... He also has a wonderful um, podcast called The Good Fight on populism and the threat to liberal democracy. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. How are you all doing? You holding on? Good, good. So I didn't, um, I didn't want to prepare uh, a text like I would normally do because I didn't want to preempt the... Uh, the process, I wanted to sort of sit in the space and, um, and try to respond to the space uh, uh, accordingly. So uh, I think I probably want to make three points. I want to make a point about um, the significance of piety, the importance of political faith, and I think I want to make the third point, I want to make a point about the transformative possibility of self and society, okay? So if you just walk with me, um, I, think we, I think we won't lose our way, okay? So I wanna first thank um, Roger, um, Bard, and the various donors for creating this space for us, right? We live in unsettled and unsettling times. And so it is very important for us to have a critical space like this, where we can come to reflect and think about our current, uh, our current political moment. So I want to thank Roger, Bard, and uh, the various donors for creating the space for us. Um, I don't very much like the question, is liberal democracy our future? I'm a political scientist, a political theorist, to be more exact. I am neither a clairvoyant nor a prophet. And so any response that I would offer up to that specific configuration of the question should be looked upon with deep suspicion and skepticism. Deep and profound suspicion and skepticism. Right? But, if, but if it is the case that we are trying to figure out how to hold on to liberal democratic institutions. If this is the question that we're interested in, then I think the space opens up for us to sort of think sort of ambitiously and thoughtfully about what the sort of orientation ought to be in order to sustain and to reconstruct liberal democratic institutions. And I think the question that we might think about is the following. How might we read the past of liberal democratic struggles such that we can find warrant for our endeavors today? Or to put it differently, how should we look or think about the past of liberal democratic struggles such that 
we can respond passionately and courageously to our current crisis. And if the past is the thing that we want to begin with as a basis for thinking about our present moment, then I think that immediately sends us to three pillars of liberal democratic struggle, right? at least as I understand it. And I think the first pillar is going to be piety, the second is going to be faith, and I think the, the last will be this business about the transformative possibilities of self and society. So what is piety? Piety is not blind deference to doctrine or to religious commitments. Piety is fundamentally a reflective endorsement of the sources that have given life to you now. That is to say, piety is the good in your past that has carried you forward into the present moment. And there is a rich tradition in American and African-American political thought in which the past serves as a well of resources. So the question that we would have to ask ourselves, right, we have to take a critical inventory of self and society and ask ourselves, what are the resources that we can draw on to sustain us in our present moment? Right? For me, personally, the resources turn out to be figures and movements that I studied. So they turn out to be figures like David Walker and Frederick Douglass in the 19th century. They turn out to be Ida B. Wells in the 19th and 20th century. They turn out to be Baldwin and King and, yes, Black Lives Matter currently. I think this brings us to the next point. So if those are the resources that I draw on, I invite you to draw on them as well. How might we understand their struggles? How do we make sense of the ways in which, for example, since I named all black figures, how do we make sense of the ways in which African Americans have consistently appealed, made appeals to the polity historically, right? With evidence that the polity will not respond appropriately or effectively? How do we make sense of the way in which they got on about the business of responding? And I think the answer is faith. Faith is not tied, as we sometimes think, to religious or theological doctrines. It can be, but it need not be. So what is faith? So Anna Julia Cooper tells us in 1892 right, that faith is the commitment to an ideal that is at variance with the reality that one finds oneself living. But it is an ideal that one is willing to fight for, and it is an ideal that one believes others can find a home in. William James right, says in 1897, right, Faith is the readiness to act in the service of a cause, the prosperous issue of which is not certified to us in advance. And yet, we cannot get on about the business of thinking about the possibility of transformation without acting. John Dewey tells us in 1934, the great American philosopher, that there is a difference between a belief that conviction, or that some conviction, ought to be supreme over our conduct and belief that a, con that a conviction exists for us as a truth of our current reality. And that we should not use the one, the latter, as an assessment of the former. Right? And so what's interesting about the group of figures that I named is that all of them crafted their political faith, faith amid practices of domination, exclusion, and alienation. David Walker, David Walker and Frederick Douglass 
were confronting the enslavement of black bodies as they were forging their faith. Douglas watched the ascendancy of Reconstruction and its crash. Ida B. Wells was confronting the disposability of black bodies as she was crafting her faith. And Black Lives Matter has crafted its faith amid the disposability of black, of black bodies and amid the fact that folks don't seem to be punished as a result. Faith is forged against a backdrop of tragedy, pain, and suffering. That is what it has always been throughout the tradition. But the meaning of political faith, particularly as a pillar propping up liberal democratic commitments, has never been measured and has never been exhausted by the reality these folks have found themselves living. And for us, it should not be measured and exhausted by the reality we find ourselves living. And so, why is it that they thought their faith, their political faith, could be compelling? Well, the reason why they thought that their political faith could be compelling is because they subscribed to the possibility, to the thought, that who we are now need not determine who we may yet become. And I know all of that sounds warm and fuzzy. It is somewhat fashionable these days to speak about doom and gloom and pessimism. And I am not suggesting that there isn't evidence for it. I'm not naive. I am under no illusion. Liberal democracy is not immune to being hollowed out, being monetized, and being captured by political thugs that would transform hate and resentment into virtues of politics. Right? But from David Walker to James Baldwin, from David Walker to Black Lives Matter, the idea has always been that the story of who we are, and this has been a story, not a sort of metaphysical or ontological, these sort of philosophical claims, just a psychological claim that we're not finished products. And if we're not finished products, then the society to which we belong and for which we are responsible is not a finished product. Right? So as you think about, and as you find yourself bombarded with the various crises we find ourselves experiencing, and you're trying to figure out how does one get on about the business of addressing this ethically and politically, I encourage you to look to your sources that has sustained you into the present. I encourage you to craft a vision of faith that can orient you in time and space. And I encourage you to see that even as it sometimes appears, the folks and communities around you seem to be finished products. They really are not. Right. Thank you. Uh, that's a tough act to follow. Um, in fact, this conference has been a series of tough acts to follow. Um, 
it's really been a pleasure um, sitting here all day and listening to you know great speakers from uh, Leon Botstein and Roger Berkowitz to Marsha Gessen and John Jeremiah Sullivan and Zephyr Teachout. Um, and it's been a pleasure, but it's been a pleasure of, of moral seriousness and earnestness. I mean, I think that one of the things that I think is right about this conference is that it has a sense of mission and of moral earnestness. And that's something that despite the times we're living in, is still missing in many of the events I go to and many of the public occasions we go to. We sort of look at Twitter and are horrified by what the president says and does. And then we sort of very quickly retreat back into our ordinary lives. Um, but it's a moment in which we actually have to find out and understand what the stakes of this political situation are and think carefully and seriously about what we can do about it. So the question that this panel poses is whether uh, liberal democracy is the future. And a few years ago, that question would have seemed bizarre. The answer would obviously have seemed yes. That's how we as a general public thought. We assumed that democracy, at least in countries like the United States or France or Germany or Sweden, was safe, but it was there to stay. But it's also how political scientists thought about it. In the 1990s, an uh, important political scientist by the name of Adam Shavosky uh, ran the numbers. He looked at all of the countries that had had a number of uh, free and fair elections in which the government had been changed, and countries that also had a GDP per capita of more than about $14,000 in present terms, and he found that none of them had lost their democracies. There was thousands of observations and none of them had lost their democracies. So, he concluded, once you've changed government for free and fair elections a couple of times, once you are relatively affluent, your political system is safe. You don't have to worry about it. In the terms of a lot of political science literature, there was a process of democratic consolidation. And this process was a one-way street. It was difficult to get there. It was difficult to get to the destination of a consolidated democracy. But once you were there, you didn't have to worry. So yes, of course democracy was going to be our future. Well, I think there's reasons to doubt that now. There's reasons to doubt it for a number of different considerations. One is that a new crop of politicians and of political systems has emerged around the world. In countries where we never thought that possible, politicians who challenge the most basic rules and norms of a democratic system have gained considerable power and in some places the highest office in the land. We now have a president who promised to leave people in suspense about whether he would accept the outcome of the 2016 election, who threatened to jail his main political adversary and who may yet follow through on some of those promises in 2020. We have authoritarian populists gaining more and more of a vote share in countries from Austria where we have elections coming up this Sunday to Germany where a far-right extremist party is now the strongest party in some of the states, to Sweden, to France. I just returned from Prague. I was at a conference there earlier this week and I realized that after they elect their own billionaire who promises to shake up the system a few days from now, uh, you will have a populist belt in Central and Southern Europe. You will be able to go all of the way from Stettin in the Baltic Sea to Athens in the Aegean without ever leaving a country that is ruled by authoritarian populists. And there's reasons for this development. As I saw in my, some of my own research, people are less invested in democracy than they once were. They're deeply disappointed with it. When you ask Americans how important it is to them to live in a democracy, among older Americans, born in the 1930s and 1940s, over two-thirds say it's absolutely important to me to live in a democracy. Among millennials, I barely count as that, but I do. Born since 1980, less than one-third 
of people ascribe that same importance to living in a democracy. Even when you ask people about extreme alternatives to democracy, the numbers are really shocking. The number of Americans who believe that a strong man leader who doesn't have to bother with parliament and elections is a good thing has gone up. 20 years ago, one in 16 Americans thought that army rule is a good system of government. Now, one in six do. Among young and affluent Americans, that figure has increased from 6% 20 years ago to 35% now. Nearly a six-fold increase in 20 years. So why are these things happening? What is going on here? Why are people voting for authoritarian populists like Donald Trump? Why are they telling pollsters that they don't care about democracy so much anymore? Well, I'm trying to figure this out and I'm trying to think about how to do the very difficult task, as you were rightly saying, of predicting the future as people who are not trained to do that and who probably are unable to do it but, but need to try and do it because we need to understand what's going on. I thought of a story about Bertram Russell who talks about a chicken on a farm. And every day, the other animals on the farm tell the chicken to be very careful and to be very mistrustful, not to trust the farmer. One day he'll kill you, they say. And the chicken says, what, what are you talking about? What, what are you going on about? Every day the farmer comes to feed me. Every day he mutters some encouraging words. He's a nice guy. Why should he suddenly come to kill me? Well, um, one day, as, as Russell says in his wry uh, and beautiful writing style, uh, the, chicken, the, the farmer does come to wring the chicken's neck, uh, demonstrating, I quote, that more sophisticated views as to the uniformity of causation would have been to the chicken's benefit. What, what does he mean by that? Well, what he means by that is that there's scope conditions, that there's background conditions that drove how the farmer acted that the chicken couldn't understand. That as long as the chicken weighed four pounds, he was too light to be taken to market or fetch a good price. And once he had grown to five pounds, the farmer's behavior would change because this is the background conditions of how he changes. It drove what incentives the farmer had. So if we want to understand why it is the democracy was so stable in the past and why it is that it seems so unstable in the present, we need to ask the chicken question. What conditions made for the stability of democracy in the past that may no longer be the case? And how can we deal with that change? Well, in my forthcoming book, The People vs. Democracy, I argue that there's at least three of those. And I want to just very briefly say something about those and something about what we can do about those. The first is the stagnation of living standards for ordinary people. All through the history of democratic stability, we've had very rapid increases in living standards from one generation to the next. From 1935 to 1960, the living standard of the average American doubled. From 1960 to 1985, it doubled again. Since 1985, it's been flat, it's been stagnant. And that makes a real difference to how people think about the political system. They never loved politicians, they never completely trusted them. But they said, let's give them the benefit of a the doubt. They seem to be sticking to the end of a deal. Now people are saying, I've worked really hard all of my life, and I don't have anything to show for it. My kids are probably going to do worse than me, so let's throw some shit against the wall and see what sticks. The second transformation is about identity. In nearly every stable democracy, countries had a mono-ethnic understanding of what the nation was. This is certainly true of all of Western Europe, where I grew up. In Germany, in Sweden, in Italy, people thought that somebody who really belongs to the nation comes from the same ethnic stock, has ancestors who have lived there for many generations. Over the last 50 years, there's been a lot of immigration, there's been a real change in that. And a part of the population has embraced that, has welcomed that, as have I. But there's parts of the population that haven't accepted it. 
but are angry and resentful about it. And we haven't yet managed to create a notion of nationhood that is widely accepted in society and that is inclusive. Now, in the United States, it's always been a multi-ethnic country in many ways, but it's also always been a country with a very steep racial hierarchy. Part of that hierarchy, unfortunately, still persists. A lot of injustices still persist. But we've actually come a long way if you compare today to what this country looked like 50 or 30 or 20 years ago. We've come a long way in overcoming that hierarchy. And some people celebrate and embrace that, as do I. But there are some people who rebel against it and who are resentful against it. And that, too, is a driver of these attacks of, on liberal democracy, on the rise of these populists. The third reason has to do with technology. There used to be a political and financial elite that has a real advantage over everybody else in setting the terms of a political discourse. That limited debate, it limited the challenges that people could make to the status quo in ways that were often problematic. But it also kept out some of the most extreme voices that spread fake news or spread racial hatred. The rise of the internet and of social media has reduced the gap between those elites and everybody else. If you have a particularly cute kitten of which you take a video, or if you are on a United Airlines plane and you're re-accommodated, and you share the video of that with 50 followers, and a sufficiently high percentage of your followers decides to share it with their followers, even if you start off with just 50 people seeing the post, it can be shared to a million, two million people in the course of an hour. That fundamentally changes the ability of political elites to control what is said and what is seen in the political discourse. And that has lots of opportunities, but it also has dangers, as we've seen very strongly over the course of the past year with quite extreme voices that don't actually have that broad support in the population, like the alt-right, like white nationalists, suddenly becoming a real part of the conversation. And that too has been one of the reasons for the rise of populism. So what do we do about these things? Well, we've got to do at least three things. We have to create an economic policy that embraces some of the benefits of globalization, that embraces some of the opportunities that the future holds, but that makes sure that those gains are actually distributed to ordinary people. It's no longer enough to see that we're an affluent country. At this point, redistributing isn't just a matter of economic justice, it's a matter of political stability. We need to make sure that people, once again, have hope for a better economic future. The second thing we have to do is cultural. It's about identity. It's to challenge the white nationalism of a right. It's to work really hard to protect people against discrimination and overcome remaining injustices. But it's also to find a way to emphasize what unites us. I think a danger in this political moment is for us to emphasize what divides us. But if we are to build a country in which we persuade people not to re-elect Donald Trump, not to let white nationalists rule this country, we need to find a political language that transforms what it is to be an American in such a way that becomes truly inclusive and that emphasizes to everybody what it is that unites us across racial and religious lines. And finally, we have to think about what to, how to deal with the rise of social media. And that's not just a matter of changing how some of the social media platforms work. It's not just a matter of persuading Facebook and Twitter to change their algorithms to make it more difficult for fake news to spread, to make it more easy to flag those things, for it is that too. It's also a matter of changing how people receive some of that content, because we're never going to be able to censor Facebook and Twitter completely, and nor should we. 
So we have to work on how people respond when we're told lies about the political institutions and the politicians, when we're told hateful things about people in society. And in order to do that, we also have to take seriously again something that we as academics have shamefully neglected, and that's to make the case for our political system. There are many things wrong with the status quo, and there are many reforms that we need to push for. There are many injustices that we still have to overcome. But there is something worth preserving about liberal democracy. And that means that our task is not just to be critical and not just to point out the bad things here and there. It's also to say why it is that we want to live in a democratic society, why it is that we want to defend liberal values like individual rights, like minority rights, like the freedom of speech. Because unless we actually fight for those things, they are now endangered. I was at a conference about a week ago where Adam Shavorsky also gave a talk. He's the one I mentioned earlier. We did the study in the 1990s proving that running the numbers, democracy is safe. And he said, well, the numbers still look good, but I'm starting to realize that our present looks quite different from the past and that there may not be an easy precedent to draw from, but for conditions were very different in the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s. And so I no longer have trust in those numbers. I now think that democracy in the United States is in danger. That was a startling thing for him to say. In my mind, there are three different scenarios of what might happen now. There's the scenario that Donald Trump manages to single-handedly destroy liberal democracy in this country. And I don't doubt that he would happily let his instinct take him there. When you see the tweets in the last days about revoking the broadcasting license for NBC, that is the definition of authoritarian populism. That is exactly how Recep Erdogan talked in Turkey, how Viktor Orban talked in Hungary, and those countries are formally democracies today, but they're not democracies in a real sense anymore. Now, he hasn't done a lot of those actions yet, and that's in part because a lot of people have been standing up to resist them. Because there is a lot of public pushback, a lot of public protest, because some of our institutions, especially free media, and especially the judiciary, is standing up to Donald Trump. I don't want to underestimate the possibility that he himself can do huge danger. People underestimated the damage done by Orban in Hungary and Erdogan in Turkey in the first years of a rule. But I don't think it's likely that he will single-handedly destroy democracy. So perhaps there's a second scenario. Perhaps there's an optimistic story to be told. Perhaps we will all stand up as one and rebel against Donald Trump. Perhaps we will manage to get him impeached or win the elections in 2020 hands down. And perhaps at that time there'll be a coming together across our divides. Perhaps people who hadn't given importance to democracy anymore now realize how important it is to preserve democracy. That's possible. <laughs> but I don't think it's that likely either. I don't think we should assume that we will win in 2020. And I certainly don't think we will assume that if we do win in 2020, the divisions in our society will miraculously heal. We need to make real changes and real transformations, give people real hope, show them that the system can deliver for them in order to heal the anger in our politics. Otherwise, after four or eight years of a sensible president being back in power, you might get another wave of this authoritarian populism, one that is even more dangerous. So in my mind, the most likely scenario may be the third one. It may be... Uh, what happened in the Roman Republic, where in the second century BC, the Gracchi came to power, responding to deep frustration of the population because of lack of economic opportunity, because of poverty. They tried to institute land reforms, but do that in a way that violated the Constitution in many ways. Instead of compromising with them, the patricians drove them out of, 
office, killed some of their supporters. And after that, for a few years, it went back to normal. Relatively ordinary politicians were re-elected. Things seemed to be going fine, but because the underlying problem wasn't solved, because the anger still kept rising, wave after wave of similar populists was elected. And over the span of half a century, Romans lost their republic. That is the scenario that haunts me. The future is not just the next 10 years, it's the next 50 years. And saving our liberal democracy is a task for the next 50 years. Now, I can't promise you that we can win that fight. I can't promise you that we can save our liberal democracies. It may be that the historical forces are so deep and so broad that we can't save the system. It may be that even if a chicken had decided to make a run for it, the farmer would have caught it. But we better try. I'm sorry to end on such a, a tritely inspirational note, but uh, I heard the, the great Amos Oz um, give a talk a few weeks ago, and he said, uh, he put the point bet better than I can, he said, there's a big fire raging, and all that each of us has is a little spoon filled with water. And so it seems pointless to do anything. How can I do anything about that fire of my little spoon of water? But the answer is that if all of us take the little spoon and carry it to the fire, then we might have a chance to extinguish it. And I think even without being able to guarantee a happy end, that's the task that each of us has. Thank you. Is, so I'm just going to start things off with um, one question and then turn it over to the audience. Um, Yasha, I kind of wish you would have gone first now. Um, so what I really want is, <laughs> my question is going to be trying to get Melvin to respond to you and get you talking to each other. Um, it strikes me um, that you're, um, you're on opposite sides of the same coin in a certain respect, both working within the tradition of American political thought, but um, you know, Melvin was describing the kind of market of and fashionability of gloom and doom and pessimism and I mean you're talking about uh, the the Roman Republic um, <laughs> and 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 leaving us on a somewhat despairing note um, and at the same time um, you seem temporally oriented towards the future you talked about the need um, to predict the future um, and think about what's going to happen, happen to implement policy changes. Um, but Melvin, I hear you talking about something else, a different way forward. Um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you're and not, not looking towards the future, but you're talking about the need to look toward the past to see what can sustain us in our tradition of collective politics and to think about the need for um, a, a political faith that's not necessarily theological but oriented toward an ideal. And so I'm just wondering if you two could respond to each other on those variances about how do we, how do we proceed? Um, yeah. um, so I think that, um, uh, um, I think there is a difference between um, uh, sort of looking to the past and simply trying to replicate it in the present that then can sustain us forward. And looking to the past and figuring how one might model the will, the energy, and the intensity in the present moment given the crises that one is facing. Right? Because the, the, what marks the tradition that I have outlined is the way in which the vision of of faith has always been an exercise of the political imagination. It has always been. I mean, it's, I find it so striking, and I enjoyed the presentation, but I find it so striking um, that we experience this time 
um, as, a, uh, as our darkest moment. Um, when, uh, just to be honest, black folks have lived in a dark moment for a very, very long time and much darker than this. And yet they've seemed to get on about the business right, of figuring out how to constitute a politics in the present that can sustain them moving forward and not commit civic suicide. Right? And what's interesting about sort of the numbers that were sort of cited earlier about millennials, it is true um, that millennials no longer look as fondly uh, as those from the 30s and the 40s once did on democracy. But there is a difference between not looking fondly on your liberal democratic institutions or set of institutions because they seem to fail and believing that the idea or the ideal of liberal democracy is something that should, that should be completely abandoned. And I think we should not run these two together. And if we keep these two separate, we now actually have a basis for how we make sense of the ways in which, despite millennials not being very confident in our liberal democratic institutions, nonetheless seem to be hitting the streets. Right. So as I was listening to your question, I thought that we actually have uh, a lot of things in common, but we agree on most things, but perhaps now we don't. Um, uh, so let's start with a disagreement, and then I'll try and work up to the agreement, or down to the agreement, I don't know. Um, so uh, the, the figures, I look at in the research, specifically try to keep those questions apart, mm -hmm. right? So the story in a lot of the literature on public opinion for a long time has been oh, people seem to be getting really critical, they get, seem to be getting really pissed off of their institutions. They no longer trust politicians, they have negative opinions of particular governments. But that's fine. Because what's going on here is that they're just becoming more critical, engaged citizens who have higher expectations. But they still believe in the underlying principles of a political system. And so there's a distinction being made between government legitimacy and regime legitimacy. And everybody was saying, well, government legitimacy has gone down, but regime legitimacy is still just as high. So, so what I, with my colleague, Roberto Stefan Foer, have done in this research is to look specifically to questions about regime legitimacy. How important is it to you to live in a democracy? Are you open, you know, do you think democracy is a bad or very bad system of government? Are you open to a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with parliament or elections? Are you open to army rule? Right? Those are not questions about what do you think of the government right now, how much trust you have in DC. Right? Those are questions about how committed are you to liberal democratic ideals. And in all of those, there's been a real deterioration over the last 20 years. So I think that yes, there's some, and obviously most people still believe in democracy, right? but the number of people has dwindled rapidly. So there's lots of people who come out in the streets because they do believe in democracy. Right? And I do think that there might be a counter-reaction to Trump going on now. So I've just got new data from 2017, and it doesn't look like that's reflected in those figures yet. But I think that people might start to learn, well, you know what? Now that I see what it looks like to have a strong Manita in government uh, who doesn't seem to be wanting to bother with independent institutions, actually, I'm going to get recommitted to it. I think that is a hope. But so far, we're not seeing that. Um, now, to the sort of uh, uh, deeper questions, really, about hope and pessimism, I suppose. Um, I, I think that we're actually quite similar, which is to say that we perceive deep challenges, and we've emphasized slightly different realms, but I think we agree, I agree with the challenges that you outlined, I'm sure that you agree with me that Donald Trump is not a great guy. Um, and yet we're trying not to be fatalistic about it. So we're trying to think carefully about what it takes to keep fighting for and to keep imagining a better polity. And the answer to that, I think, is parallel on both sides. It's not to say on my side of it, well, you know what, people are falling out of love of democracy and some of the conditions for its stability seem to be going away, so let's just give up and, you know, perhaps emulating China wouldn't be so bad after all. And on your side, I think it's not saying well, you know what, in the end, America is just a deeply white nationalist country and we should recognize that and stop having faith, stop having 
imagination of a better society, stop making appeals to the polity, and just give up. I think we're both committed to thinking about how do we create an equal, liberal, multi-ethnic democracy, despite the obvious challenges right now. And so in that sense, I think we both have a deep pessimism in our analysis, but also a real optimism in, in our determination to keep fighting for an ideal that's ultimately shared. I want to turn it over to the audience. Um, I'll have some questions. So maybe some students first, and then we have a Sam back here. The one there, Willem. Hi. Um, so I was wondering. Um, so do you think that um, Donald Trump is more like um, not a new evil, but something like uh, worse than anything? Or I, I don't know how to put it, but. Um, or is he sort of a representation rising up of what has been going on for the past 400 years, if that makes sense? So like, um, like, I don't know, sorry. Um, so how do we, I guess, address that? Like, is he something new and evil? Or is he like something that has been, yeah? a progression that is now like just the face of what has been going on. Well, in my mind, he is something new, right? That doesn't mean that he doesn't draw on certain instincts or on certain ideas that have precedence in American history. When he talks about America first, part of what makes it so chilling is that he draws on a previous movement that had the slogan, America first, which was allied with Nazi Germany, right? Uh, when he uses, uh, n not really dog whistles, it's more like, you know, I don't know, dog trumpets or something. Um, uh, you know, he's obviously appealing to a set of prejudices and so on that, that, that have existed through American history, no doubt. But uh, when he threatens to jail his political adversary, when he says, I might not accept the outcome of this election, when he says, I might just revoke the license of one of the major broadcasters in this country, those are genuinely new things. There is no precedent for that. And the fact that there's precedent for some of what he does, or roots in American history for some of the animus that is driving his most hardcore supporters doesn't mean that we can't at the same time recognize how genuinely new some of his deep disregard for the democratic rules of the game are. And, you know, one of the things is actually that the groups in which there's most optimism when you look at opinion polls in the United States today are ethnic minorities, at least that was true until about a year ago. And the reason is that the life has gotten a lot better for them. That doesn't mean that it's fair now, but it does mean that compared to 20 or 40 or 60 years ago, it is better to live in the United States today if you are an ethnic or a sexual minority and so on and so forth. And so, the reaction against it obviously draws on something that's been there for a long time in American history. But the reason why these improvements could have happened is that even in the darkest times of American history, we preserved some of the institutional forms that allowed for suppressed people, for oppressed people, to make appeals to the polity and to organize and to do all of those things in order to fight, in a very difficult way, to fight for those improvements. And so the threat, so this is not something where sort of like, you know, white liberals care about institutional norms and, you know, people who really are in the struggle realize that those are just abstract things that we shouldn't care about. One of the reasons why we should care about those norms is that they allow us to relitigate and relitigate those political fights. Once you've lost your ability to 
organize democratically, to vote a government out, to make an appeal to the polity, the chance of making real improvements for groups that still face real discrimination dwindle very quickly. That is one of the dangers of attacks on liberal democracy. So, I mean, I just, just a quick word. I mean, I think that the novelty of uh, Donald Trump um, sort of comes in a following way. Um, there are two elements that inform um, any politician that runs for the presidency and that ultimately secures the presidency. Um, the one is a, a lust for power, right? Um, but the other one is a belief in the sort of sacred quality of the office of the presidency and the institutions. Donald Trump has the one, but not the other. And he defines his very identity by being opposed to the other. And in that respect, he is um, something quite distinct uh, than we've seen in, a, in American presidential politics. I just want to follow up really quickly. Um, you started by outlining some of the novel crises that we're facing today, like Donald Trump's Twitter threat to NBC, which hasn't happened from a sitting president before. And thinking about moving forward in this question of liberal democracy, it's for both of you. I'm wondering, can you imagine um, a way forward politically, democratically, I'm, I'm thinking in the line of a political faith, but in a way that does not consistently return us to an identity politics. You brought up race and sex and gender and things that have made America a seemingly more democratic country over the past 40, 50 years, but it also strikes me that those forms of politics can be incredibly divisive and driving the doom and clue narrative to a certain extent. You know, I'm just, I'm just always, I'm always so puzzled by this claim about identity politics. I'm not making a claim, just the, a question. No, 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 but, but the claim, right, we think about Mark Lula, right? So, so the claim is out there, right? And what's interesting is that whenever we have had a problem with respect to identity politics, it has always come from the, whi the, the whites and it has always come from the right. It has always been about a certain kind of elevation of whiteness over non-whites. And what, has, what is interesting about particularly the logic of American politics is that the, the sort of problematic around identity politics has always revolved around one group, right, namely white Americans, perceiving that there is no way to share the goods of a liberal democratic society with non-whites without that simultaneously diminishing their own psychological, material, and ethical standing in the polity. When the project of identity politics has come from the left, it has always been, historically in the United States, in the service of inclusion. The understanding that there's enough goods to go around in which we all can share. Right? And so I'm always, the, the, the claim that I made earlier about civic suicide is a function of those who are previously, in their minds, and I think rightfully so, occupied positions of power, and this perception that somehow that was on the decline with the browning of the nation. And Donald Trump exploited and spoke to that very powerfully. Right? So I, I completely agree with your way of characterizing what kind of politics we should fight for. Um, I do think there's a more complicated element to it. Right? So I think, um, first of all, right now, there is a, a very powerful um, set of discriminatory attitudes um, that has been weaponized by the far right and now has a seat in the White House. Um, far out of proportion, I think, with, with, with the amount of support it has in the general population, but, but very powerful at the moment. 
And the thing that's absolutely clear is that we have to stand up to that. And that we have to defend the targets of that. And the targets of that, as we have seen over the last months, is everything from uh, African Americans to Puerto Ricans to sexual minorities uh, to Muslims, right, to Jews. Um, there's no question about that. And, and, and some of the people who criticize identity politics make it sound sort of like, well, let's defend people against that, but let's not go too far in defending people against that. And there can be none of that. Mm -hmm. right? The defense is 100% mm -hmm. or 110% if we can manage it. Um, there is a question, though, about both tactically and normatively, about what, what is the nature of that defense? And what ideals are we trying to put forward in order to persuade people to stand up to that white nationalism and to that, those, that persisting injustice? Mm -hmm. And there, I think there's a real debate. And, and my stance is ultimately, I think, the same one as you, which is, and the same one is, that has always historically been the one put forward by people who might now be accused of having done identity politics. And that is to make an appeal for inclusion in the nation. It is in the civil rights era to say, yes, the ideals of a constitution are great. There is something special about the principles on which we've built the American nation. On what basis do you justify excluding us from those? If you really believe in those things, shouldn't you be fighting for us to be included under those principles? That has historically been reasonably effective because it builds a common identity. It doesn't paper over the fact that there are specific groups that are discriminated against for specific reasons, but it's building towards a common politics. Right? And then on the other hand, I think there is sometimes an instinct to say, well, you know what? Those principles are so hypocritical because so many people are excluded from them that you know what? Fuck those principles. Fuck freedom of speech. Fuck the Constitution. And I don't think that either tactically or normatively that's the right response. The thing that I'm still fighting for is a society in which everybody on equal terms is included under those same principles. And that's because I both believe that that's the only society that will ultimately be just, and because I believe that that's the only way that we have any chance of winning that political fight. Thank you. So, um, the gentleman in the fifth row, the hand, Will? Uh, the, one, the one in front of you, I'm so sorry. He had his hand up first. Thank you very much for a stimulating, very thought-provoking, very rich discussion. Also very much for, thank you for the image of the chicken <laughs> and of the fire. I think it's clear that democracy worked when it could deliver the goods, but when there was another thing, namely the Soviet Union, as a deterrent, as a model of something that was not working. And since the end of the Cold War, that has fallen by the wayside. And what has happened since is a system spinning out of control, and that's why the, your image about the fire, I think, is also very apt. Because I think we are, as a society, as a system, a Western system running out of runway, even vis-a-vis -vis climate change. Our economic model is not survivable. And so you have people voting for a charlatan who is a symptom, who is not actually I mean, he's just a puppet there. The real powers are, in my view, for example, Wall Street or the fossil industry. The New York State Controller every March puts out a report on the bonuses paid on Wall Street. This year's report showed that last year $24 billion were paid in bonuses on Wall Street, which is more than the entire U.S. population on minimum wage. So that is the real power relationship. The same with the fossil fuel industry that spends $1.8 billion a day on prospecting oil, 
even though we cannot even burn what is in the ground right now. So the crisis of democracy, what we are talking about in my view, is how to win against material forces that are ending the civilization on earth as we know it. And there we don't have a lot of time. We don't have until 2030, 2045, because the hurricanes, the fires, what we're seeing in Africa will accelerate. And I think, and I'm hoping that uh, you will prove me wrong, and I'm uh, Cassandra Doomsayer, that the authoritarianism will actually increase because the crisis will increase and we will not have space for deliberation. It will be for action and it will be action against others, minorities, whatever, foreigners. And so the authoritarian strain that we're seeing, and I hope that you will, both of you will prove me wrong, um, are accelerating and we are running out of time for the model of deliberative democracy building coalitions reasoned argument. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the nice stories that people told themselves, and that especially people like us who are political theorists told, them, told ourselves, is that, you know, in the same way in which we've come to believe in some of those things, uh, sitting around a seminar table and really thinking through the principles, and we have a deep commitment to some of those ideals, um, that's how it works in you know, the general population. And I, and I think that's, that's not the case. The reason why liberal democracy has been so successful in persuading people is that it's performed incredibly well. It's always been as much uh, government performance legitimacy as it has been ideological legitimacy. And as performance legitimacy has gone down, as liberal democracy has stopped delivering for people in the kind of way that it did um, uh, in past decades, people have become more disenchanted with it. Um, that's certainly one of the drivers of it. Uh, and as I was saying in my talk, I agree with you that it's really urgent to make sure that there is still economic growth. It's not as fast as it might have been in the 50s or 60s, but there is still economic growth. Um, it's just not being shared very equally. And as a result, the 0.1% and the top 1% have done just fine for the last 25 years, but most people haven't. And so there's a reason why they're pissed off. Now, what I don't agree with is that it takes a complete change of system in order to deal with those problems. I think you can have globalization and you can have much of the capitalist system we have and distribute better. It's happening in Sweden. In Sweden, the average person did get a 60% increase in living standards over the last 15 years. Not because there's some magic going on, but because the political system is less captured, because there haven't been huge tax cuts for the richest people because the welfare state has been preserved and even increased in certain ways, right? That country is still one of the best countries in the history of humanity to live in, and it's a capitalist system. It's just a capitalist system with a robust welfare state and economic policies designed to help rather than harm ordinary people. I would say the same for climate change. Again, both tactically and normatively. There are people like Naomi Klein who say the only way to deal with climate change is to abolish capitalism. Now, first of all, if you tell people the only way that you can deal with climate change is that you have to give up your car and you have to give up your heating and you have to give up your air conditioning and you can never fly to go on holidays, what are they going to do? They're going to deny climate change. Because they don't want to think that they have to give up all the things they love and they don't like cognitive dissonance. So the easiest way to resolve it is to say, well, perhaps they're just lying to me about climate change, just a conspiracy to make me give up my lifestyle. Now, there's an alternative to that, which is that actually solar power and other renewables are starting to rival fossil fuels in price. That if you put the right incentives in place, if you put a carbon tax in place, if you uh, have the state spending a lot on research and development to improve renewable energy further, if you spend the money it takes in order to recapture some of the carbon, in order to um, adapt to some degree to uh, some of the challenges that are coming on coastlines and so on, you can deal with climate change and you can reduce radically the CO2 we are, we are emitting 
without giving up on our economic system, and without giving up the affluence that it has afforded the world. And that to me is the right response and it's the right rhetorical appeal, telling people, yes, we need to take steps. Yes, it means spending some money on it now. But the virtue of it is that in the end, we're still going to be affluent. We're going to be a lot more affluent 100 years from now than we are today. And we're going to deal with climate change at the same time. That's a more persuasive message than saying, the world is about to end and we have to go back to the 19th century in order to deal with it. Because we're not going to win that debate. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I largely think that this is, this is right. I mean, the, the, I mean, the other problem I, I think we have to deal with is, is that the sort of cultural contradictions that a capitalist society poses to um, uh, democracy, I think at the present moment, what, what, sort of 20% of, of uh, sort of, or 80% of, of, of wealth is owned only by 20% of the American population. So there's a kind of, there's a sort of, psychological orientation that comes um, with the kind of sort of, sort of sort of economic system that we find ourselves in. And it raises questions in my mind, even as the, uh, sort of the harbinger, sort of the proponent of faith, but it raises questions in my mind about how to disaggregate um, a psychological orientation that runs counter to um, a broad-based distributive policy, how to disaggregate that from the system that seems to produce that seems to produce that logic, right? And so I'm sometimes persuaded by, by by those who argue for a kind of total revolution with respect to um, uh, the sort of economic system uh, that we find ourselves uh, living, and it, and I'm a little and I'm always concerned about those who um, they don't intend to do this, but that, but that because they say we don't need to sort of change our economic model, uh, inadvertently arrest our imagination from trying to figure out what could be beyond it, right? And we're in a, we're in a moment where our imaginations are constantly arrested. They're constantly strangled, right? Um, and it's not clear to me um, if you look at um, the various levels of economic inequality in the United States, it's not clear to me that the system and the psychology that produced it right, can, can produce its opposite, if you see what I mean. Right? Thank you. This, this yeah. student, right? Yes, the sweater. Um, so I, I had a, several questions, but I'll limit it to two. Um, those being, so I, I've noticed some, some criticisms that I've heard of the, of the media by both Donald Trump and supporters of him are that they, uh, the media treats him very unfairly. But for example, I'm not really sure if, what that means because I've seen, you know, during the election, uh, for example, CNN gave him a lot of coverage. Uh, I'm pretty sure they, yeah, they, 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 cover, uh, they did a lot of live streams of his um, rallies. And so t I think two questions I would ask are, is, is, the like, yeah, is the media treating him unfairly and do they have to treat him fairly? Are they obligated to treat him with the same level of uh, respect as they would for any other <coughs> political figure, I guess? I mean, it, it, during the election, um, it, you know, I think the media was um, and various stations were just happy that a presidential candidate was calling in, um, and that when opportunities were offered, as we know, to Hillary Clinton's campaign to call in, um, she decided not to do that um, because were she to do that it would be a context in which she wasn't being handled, as it were, right? That the setup wasn't being properly staged, right? The reason why Donald Trump felt comfortable doing it is because he's a master at it, right? Um, and, and, and given our sort of propensity toward, and this is a sort of common and trite uh, claim now, but given our propensity toward uh, thinking about um, not just politics, but, you know, uh, everything in our lives, um, as a sort of, sort of reality show that's there to entertain, um, uh, Trump took advantage of it. But it is, 
I, I don't think that it is the um, uh, obligation or duty of the media to try to handle Donald Trump fairly or unfairly. Right? It is their duty to, um, uh, to communicate information and to participate in the process of uh, revealing uh, information that can be used as part of judgments toward truth about how we ought to respond to our, to our political climate. But, but what's interesting, and, and it would be great to get you on this, because what's interesting about this is that CNN ran a focus group uh, last month, and these were supporters of Trump. And it wasn't scientific, it was only about 15 folks around the table. But what was interesting was that the, uh, these well-meaning ordinary citizens uh, seemed uninterested or unwilling to distinguish between Donald Trump as a purveyor of truth and knowledge and the media as a purveyor of truth and knowledge. And they seemed unwilling to do this because they could cite instances and, and they were right in their instances, in which the media seemingly participated in misleading them. And so since the media participated in misleading them historically, why should they think that the media has a high ground with respect to the circulation of information over Trump? And since Trump is a supporter, or he's fighting for what they perceive to be um, uh, their concerns, he achieves, in their mind, greater credibility over the media. Right? And so when he says fake news, it's not, just a, it's not just a line. It now participates in the narrative that these citizens were already telling themselves about the media. So I think that this is one instance of a larger class of problems for people who are determined to preserve democratic norms. So uh, let me start with a metaphor. If you want to play football and you turn up to the game with your team and a couple coaches and the other side turns up with their team and a couple coaches and a hundred guys with baseball bats in tow who are coming on the field to beat you up, what do you do? Well, you can just pretend that you're playing football, but you're just going to get beaten up. Mm -hmm. Or you can fight back, but A, they're going to win because they have 100 guys with baseball bats and you don't. Uh, and if you fight, you're sure not going to play football anymore. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? I don't know the answer to that, right? I mean, the, the thing that Hillary Clinton said and Barack and Michelle Obama said in the campaign was when they go low, we go high. And they've been mocked for that since. Mm -hmm. And it's not a satisfactory answer. But to say when they go low, we go low is not an answer either. Because in order to preserve our political system, we need certain norms in which we agree. And if they start to attack those and we start to say, well, in that case, we'll ignore the norms as well, then we very rapidly lose our political system. Now, you know, when the President of the United States is using the bully pulpit of his office in order to spread straightforward lies, like three million people voted legally, what do you do? You can't preserve the old sort of slightly staid rule, but, but, but in certain ways desirable rule, of journalism according to which you're trying to be sort of even-handed between major politicians. Because that would mean just reporting, well, Donald Trump says that three million people voted legally and, you know, Chuck Schumer says that that didn't happen. That's absurd. There's no evidence that three million people voted legally. There's a lot of evidence that they didn't. So instead you have to say, well, Donald Trump says without any evidence, or Donald Trump lies, that three million people voted legally. But then, you're not treating them even-handedly, you're clearly favoring one side, but that's because the facts favor one side. So, you're doomed if you do, and you're doomed if you don't. We have a question over here. Um, 
do you think as Donald Trump rose to power that the inequality that is so heavily rooted in America gained more attention or did it become more of a problem? And my second question was... Can, I'm sorry, can you repeat the first question a little louder for us? Do you think as Donald Trump rose to power that the inequality that is so heavily rooted in America gained more attention or did it become more of a problem? You heard me? I, I think what was the question that do we think that if, if Trump gets reelected, um, sort of it'll, it'll deepen inequality in America further? That, that no, as worth, he rose to power, did it become more of a problem or did it, gain, or did it just gain more attention? Inequality in the country? Yes. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I, oh, do you have a second question? No, I was just, I was okay. just furthering my question. Uh, I think both, right? I mean, um, you know, certainly the policies, I mean, this is one of the things that uh, seems paradoxical about Donald Trump, but is actually very typical of people in, in, in uh, of, of a town populace around the world. So I just returned from, from Prague, uh, as I mentioned, and, um, you know, there the second richest man in the country is likely to be elected prime minister uh, on Sunday, right? And he's rising to power precisely by saying, look at these elites in Prague sitting around these lovely cafes and so on, That's, those aren't real Czech people. I'm standing for ordinary Czech people in the small towns and so on who haven't done as well for the last 25 years. But what he's going to do in government is to redirect all of the sort of EU funds for the Czech Republic to his own businesses, right? Now, that sounds familiar because it sounds familiar from Donald Trump, right? I mean, he's somebody who has appealed to an understandable sense of frustration and anger because of inequality, which has helped to drive his rise. But what he's doing in government is to violate every rule of ethics in order to uh, help himself in all kinds of ways and to pass tax reform that are going to, tax reforms that are going to deeply deepen inequality in America. I mean, I think that the, you know, what's interesting, I think that the, um, And, and I don't mean this in a kind of nostalgic way, but I, I do think that there was um, a missed opportunity um, in not having Bernie Sanders um, on the presidential ticket uh, going up against Donald Trump. But I mean it in this sense. But if you think about um, uh, after the Civil War and the rise and crash of Reconstruction, and you think about the movement of blacks, black Americans from the South to the North. Um, uh, uh, sort, of, sort of rich and up and coming um, white financiers and uh, uh, businessmen noticed that there was an opportunity um, for poor white uh, Americans to consolidate their political energies and efforts with poor black Americans. And part of what they did was to drive a wedge between the two groups by reminding poor white Americans, to, reminding them of two things. One, that there is scarcity of jobs and so you'll have to compete with those other people who are not like you. And Two, you don't want to find yourself politically or socially um, uh, in cooperation with those black folks over there, right? You fast forward to Donald Trump. If one of the problems that drove so many white Americans to him has something to do with the perception of um, uh, so economic inequality, the sense that the system doesn't work for them, or the sense that the system is only benefiting the, 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 the top, it does raise a question about what would have happened if one had a narrative like Bernie Sanders that tried to promote um, uh, uh, a more um, sort of fair distributive model that try to simultaneously hold in view the benefits of that wide distributive model for all Americans. I mean, it raises a question of whether or not 
going head to head with the, with the one who wants to drive a wedge by suggesting that there's a whole group of people who, are, who have taken your jobs or endangering your jobs against one who wants to say, no, 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 that's actually not the case at all. Um, this, these sort of the top percentage, um, that these big banks, these big businesses, what would have been sort of the, the sort of outcome, the sort of outcome here? In the absence of that, what we find ourselves falling, or what I often find myself falling back on, um, is the this, this story about a sort of racial animus, um, sort of, uh, nationalism, and, um, and the like, that seem to have been deployed um, in the service by Donald Trump of what he called the forgotten man, right, who's forgotten economically, right, has been deployed to say that this, this other group, right, whether it is um, immigrants, whether it's African Americans, it is this other group that is responsible for your subordination and only I can save you. So, so one thing that's absolutely true is that um, the 2016 election proved that if somebody with, you know, a moderate and in many ways quite sensible vision of continuity runs against somebody with an extremist vision of change, mm -hmm. the extremist vision of change wins. Now that's not necessarily because people prefer extremists over people who are sensible but it is that they prefer change over continuity. And so one of the big intellectual tasks that we all have for the next years is to think about how we can give people a credible sense that, you know, a candidate who's not extreme and who actually um, proposes solutions that really would work and really would improve people's lives can nevertheless stand for some very meaningful change and improvements for ordinary people. Um, and that's a political program that uh, I would say neither the far left in the United States or Europe or anywhere else I know, nor the center left in the United States or in Europe or anywhere else I know has had for a long time. And that's a problem. Not a totally pessimistic note to end on. <laughs> please, please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.